The Catholic view of the relationship between the life of faith and the life of the mind, between piety and liberal learning, between faith and reason, between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world is decidedly a, a more ironic one than that implied by St. Paul. It is certainly not a characteristic Catholic practice to engage in biblical proof texting. But if I were to do so, I would cite Mark 12:30, Jesus' answer to the question of the first and greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The cross reference is to Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Did you catch the difference? Jesus has added mind to the Old Testament commandment. To be faithful followers of Christ, we are enjoined insofar as we are able to pursue the love of God by means of the reason and intellect, as well as with our other faculties. Of course, everything turns on the question of what that might mean. How exactly does one love the Lord God with all one's mind? In what remains of my talk, therefore, I would like to examine the features of the Christian faith that have led Catholics to their high view of human, of the human reason and the human mind. As I proceed, I will draw attention from time to time to what I believe are the points of Catholic uniqueness as seen from the Protestant perspective. And I would like to begin with the most fundamental thing of all, the incarnation. Among the Catholic practices that John Adams mentioned in his letter to Abigail was the genuflections, the bowing on one knee, which for Catholics is the gesture of profound respect before that which is holy. During the Catholic Mass each Sunday, the Nicene Creed is professed by the whole congregation, and in the High Mass, the Creed is sung, Credo in Unum Deum. The rubrics call for the congregation to genuflect, or in the Novus Ordo after Vatican II, to bow deeply at the most solemn moment of the creed, the central mystery of the Christian faith. I think it is fair to say that most Protestants would expect such a gesture to occur at the words, et resurrexit tertia die secundum scriptoras. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. Surely the resurrection is that on which our faith stands or falls. If Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. As used to be said, we are an Easter people. But that is not the case. In fact, Catholics genuflect at the words, et incarnatus est de spiritu sancto ex Maria Virgine, et homo factus est. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. A Catholic might therefore want to say, we are a Christmas people. Of course, all Christians are both Christmas and Easter people. But the relative emphasis placed on the incarnation in comparison with the resurrection is, I think, it is fair to say, characteristically Catholic. And the reason is not difficult to discern. If God has become a man, then it follows logically that death could have no victory over him. Something like the resurrection and the ascension is to be expected as almost natural if God has become a man. But as Saint Anselm argued in his Curdeus Homo, while it is fitting that God should have brought salvation to mankind by means of substitutionary atonement on the cross, it was not necessary for him to do so. Mankind could have been redeemed by God without the incarnation. And moreover, as Don Scotus speculated most forcefully among Catholic theologians, even without the fall, there are strong arguments for the view that the incarnation would have taken place anyway. Indeed, that the incarnation of the Son of God was in some sense God's central purpose in his creation of the world. What we can say with certainty is that even had the fall of man not happened and death not come into the world, the incarnation would nevertheless be the great event of history. Whereas the resurrection, whereas the resurrection is the Christian mystery that concerns us most existentially as fallen men and women, the incarnation is the Christian mystery that concerns us most existentially as men and women per se. These are the reasonings that lie behind the Catholic practice of genuflecting at the incarnatus in the creed. The infinite, eternal, and almighty God has entered into history and taken on the finitude of human nature. 
that such an extraordinary thing did in fact come to pass is by far the most surprising thing ever to have happened. It is the great event to which the church bears witness through the ages. In the incarnation, Christ has revealed the face of God to man. But Pope John Paul II was fond of saying also, he has revealed man to himself. God has come near to us. God is no longer the holy other. Rather, he has become one of us. And from this, certain consequences flow. For one thing, the incarnation renders untenable all forms of Gnostic dualism. Gnosticism has proven a perennial temptation for human beings, and especially for intellectuals. It seeks to exalt the spirit by denigrating the world of matter, including the human body. But if God has taken up human nature, becoming like us in all things save sin, then the body is not in itself anything vile. The body and the things of the body are not to be despised, but to be honored. From the incarnation, therefore, flows the great tradition of Catholic art, a phenomenon radically different from the other so-called Abrahamic faiths of Judaism and Islam, with their strictures against representational art, and different as well from most of the Protestant tradition. More than 20 years ago, I visited the great Baroque monastery of Einsiedeln in Switzerland. Amidst a riot of colorful paintings, the arms and legs of massive statues of saints and angels fairly leap from the walls above the choir stalls of the monks. Musing on that sight, I thought then, surely all this would drive a Muslim to madness. But from a masterpiece like Einsiedeln to the no doubt far less expert artwork encountered by John Adams at Old St. Mary's, all are, for believers in the incarnation, works of utmost piety. One cannot give glory to God by denigrating man, for God himself has become a man.